Hello, everyone. Welcome to Improve Your JavaScript in by 20% in five whole minutes. A bold claim I made with no thinking. Um, before I start, if you were in the keynote, I'd like to let you know this is an AVO safe zone. Please feel free to talk about your love of AVOs here as much as you like. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Robert. I've been around for a while. I write stuff at my blog at SA Dev. I run a conference called DevConf, which I'm passionate about. Uh, it's all about how we build communities and bring people together. And very, very recently, I started my own thing. Uh, and I'm not sure quite what I do all the day, but I do a lot of stuff. And if you'd like to get hold of me, if you just take my name and put an at between any of those, it gets to me. Uh, so feel free to email me or reach me on LinkedIn or whatever you feel is comfortable. I'd love to chat. Um, this talk, if you read the description, good for you. Uh, nobody does, but it's like one simple trick that makes your JavaScript training feel faster. Five to 10 minute lightning talk. I thought this was a brilliant idea. I'm going to just put that in. Swan, swander, wonder, swander. Hmm. We need a new word for that. I'm going to go with waddle because ducks waddle over to escape and do a quick talk. And I had really based this on one tool I'd used for two days, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, but you know, stuff happens in life and stuff happens where they go, Hey, you know, you, you had five minutes idea. Could you make it 45? And I was like, sure, I'll give you anything, buddy. I'm pretty sure I hadn't had coffee that day. Um, because if I'd thought about it, I'd be like, what am I going to talk about for 45 minutes? So there is a five minute part of this that tells you how you can make your JavaScript 20% faster. Uh, I don't know where that is. You're going to have to look out for it and find that. that that's on you for today. Um, so I thought, since I've got a lot more time, maybe we should make this a bit different, right? Thinking about what, like he was saying this morning, that fear, that anxiety, that pain that comes from new tech. You know, he had this slide with every six months is a new JavaScript framework. Um, that's tough, right? It's tough to grow a skill set in that world where things are moving so fast. These are from the State of JavaScript 2023 survey. They are various problems and analyses. Um, I know the title is type, uh, JavaScript, um, but if you look at the biggest picture there, most people actually use TypeScript now. TypeScript is kind of one. The Simon Stewart used to run the greatest conference in the country, and one day he will do it again for me because I love it and miss it. But I was lucky enough to get on stage there and say, like, TypeScript's going to be the future, and got told by lots of people I was wrong. Uh, I was right then. Uh, I know I'm right about one thing right on the last slide today and probably nothing else. So that's the two times I get to be right in life. But yeah, I think we've all kind of gone to TypeScript. What I show you today is going to be some TypeScript, some JavaScript, but it kind of all works. But if you're like me, building projects for clients, you build in TypeScript and you build on Node. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, you build on Node or you build in the browser, which is this picture here. It shows you the sort of usage of where you run your JavaScript. That should have, you can see there's two big lines there, and then it drops off. How many people here are like not running on the browser or Node, right? Like, it's, there are people, but what is that? What does that look like? And if you are running on TypeScript and Node, then you're using build tools. And you can see there's the build tool problems there. This is sentiment analysis of Webpack, which is the most used build tool at the moment. And more people hate using Webpack than like using it. It has become the SharePoint of JavaScript. I thought that would get a bit of a laugh. Oh, well. Um, so like this talk, if you want to rush off and go and look at, say, like Rudy's talk where he blows up a car, uh, now's your time. I won't be offended. Uh, but we're not going to focus purely on performance today. We're going to focus on how we all can get together and make JavaScript 20% better. And I'm, I'm bringing you all in on this because this talk is kind of rough, and I might need your help infecting my code. Uh, and I don't have an AI duck so to make it better. So. With that in mind, nobody's left. Thank you. That's quite cool. Uh, let's do a quick review of how we code. So step one, get clone Oop. on my machine. Uh, oh, actually, I wanted to say, I, I put that in there with no comment. I thought that's super easy. Until recently, I had to do the large file supporting get clone with a unique SSH set. Uh, I'm still recovering. Um, so maybe next year, I'll just be like, how to improve Git. 
and it will be a talk about subversion, I think. Um, <laughs> thank you to all the people old enough to get that joke. That's, it, it warms my heart to know I'm not the oldest friend for you. Uh, obviously, then we do MPMI. We fire up Visual Studio Code. We then fire up Copilot and say, how the hell do I make Visual Studio and TypeScript work with modules? Because shit knows what the difference between a module and a common JS library is and why I can't do one or the other. It just never works. Eventually, we do TypeScript compile. And then we can run it with Node. And finally, we make some money, hopefully. That's, that's what we do, right? Like, that's, the, that's what I've defined programming. That's like a three-year course at university done on one slide. Um, so what, where should we start on this? Like, let's start as close to the top as possible. And let's start with NPM. Um, it has problems, right? It's crap slow. Uh, literally, yesterday I was listening to a podcast on InfoSec, and Iranian hackers have done another supply chain attack into NPM. So people are grabbing stuff off NPM, installing it, and it's installing crypto miners and backdoors and all wonderful things. Uh, dependency resolutions, a whole thing on its own. Some people remember the drama with pad left, right? And weird configs. I've worked in places where it's like, it doesn't work unless you have an NPM RC file and with 40 things in it. And that has to be in a readme that you have to find, figure out how you get without cloning. And it's, it's a pain in the life. But obviously, the biggest problem is node modules. Um, yeah. But, but you are not, you're not stuck, right? There are other choices. Uh, we have five good ones right now, various flavors of good. Um, I don't like how Yarn names things, though, because it's hard to know what Yarn people are talking about. But there's Classic Modern and PMP. There's the equally terribly named PNP and PM. I'm going to have to do that slowly every time because it's hard for my brain. Um, and Bun. Bun's the best named of the lot. Therefore, it should win. That's kind of where I am. Um, and yeah, I spent a lot of time reading and watching videos trying to figure out what is different between all of these. And um, we're going to have a look at that now. Uh, since we're at a talk with ducks and AI is popular, I figured the best thing you can do with an AI is make it show your nightmares. I think Lucky was doing the same. He probably stole it from me. So that's my nightmare of giving a talk about packages. And it's just a reminder that I need to go to code, go here. Uh, right, so welcome to command prompt. Do shout if it's not big enough, if you can't see, actually. Might cut off a little bit at the bottom for the people in the room. So we'll move it up a smidge. Um, right, I'm in a folder called escape. Let's make a new folder. And you get to watch me badly type. Um, and we're going here. Whoa. Um, and one of my favorite things to use, it's actually, I just put this in like the last minute, but I really love this. If you're not using Node version manager, it's the business because you can do stuff like this. And now it will switch me to 20. I, you saw that it had 14 as an option there. I needed 14 this week for a project. Ugh, I'm still, I'm not, the code doesn't run at all, it's, so that's fine. Um, but you can just switch to that. Um, and if you really, really fancy, uh, you can do something like this, uh, two dot node version manager RC. And that will put it there. And now my uh, terminal, with all my prompts and everything has actually picked up that file and will change it automatically. So when I get the file, I'm always on the right version and it's really, really useful. It's not too important. Um, but yeah, so let's go and turn this into an NPM project. And we'll say yes to everything. I'm sure this is fine. Yeah, didn't break. Cool, and uh, NPM add moment, because old libraries are the best. <laughs> <laughs> Right, uh, at this point, if we look in here, we have a node modules folder. Actually, let's jump to code, because code will be a little bit easier to see. And we go into here, we've got a node modules folder, package JSON. Hopefully, if you're in this room, you're either, this is new to you, welcome, JavaScript development's not that bad, you'll see. Um, if this, if you are doing JavaScript development, you've, you've seen that you've got a lock file uh, and a node folder with a bunch of stuff in it. Um, one of the easiest things you can do is switch to yarn. Uh, I'm running Yarn Classic on here, and you do that by just typing Yarn. It uses the same package.json format as Node, and all that really changes in here 
is you get a yarn lock file, which is just in its own magic loud. Works pretty much the same. I've had once where there was like some weird dependency resolution thing between the two. Um, but it's pretty much much of muchness. And it's faster, and we'll get to that just now. Right, PN, no, P and PM. I have to literally say that like in my head it's two words. Same thing. Ooh, not the same thing. Let's do install. There we go. Installed, did its thing. What's really cool here is it's like, hey, you had some shit in there. I'm going to clean that up for you. Don't worry about it. It's all good, uh, which I quite like. And the reason it did that is because if we have a look at the node modules folder, it's not put moment in there anymore. Um, for those, I don't know if you'll see this. I'm trying with labels. That there is a symlink. PMP, PNPM. Better. As it's not going to be called because I'm struggling too much. But uh, uses symlinks. It puts things in a single place on your hard drive. So if you have the same dependency at the same version multiple times, it's not filling up your hard drive with crap. It also means if you need to install, it can pull from the single location on your hard drive. It means installs are fast because it's a symlink. It's really, really cool. Um, yeah, so we have that. Again, if we have a look in here, we get a lock file. It's in YAML because. You like people like YAML, I guess. You know, significant white space is never a problem. Um, the laughs were from people with YAML, with YAML like PTSD there. Right, let's do one more, which is bun. And this is the one that's easy to say. And we can do bun install. Uh, that was really quick. It too does like the cool symlink stuff. It too does uses the same package JSON. All of this works the same as you'd expect. The only funky thing here is that it's a lock file that is not text. That's it. Uh, they chose not to do text because why would you ever look at your lock file? That's weird. And also, they can run this faster. Bun really cares, really cares about performance. So we have all that set up. We have this here. Let's run a, a, a little competition. So I'm using Hyperfine. Hyperfine is a way to run performance tests against CLI stuff. This is the best case scenario. Uh, so it's using like whatever caching and so on. It's pretty much the same for the worst case scenario where you have no caches. Um, and so this will now run against bun, NPM, NPM thing, and yarn. And it's going to run all four of them. And it's going to tell us which is the fastest. Why is that important? Because you do this often. Pretty much every time you get pull, you should be running the NPM by so you can make sure you got the latest versions. Um, so this does cleanups and all that sort of stuff during them. It's almost done. While wow, that's happening, does anybody want to duck? Yes. All right. Good. Right, uh, there we go. Bun ran faster. <laughs> uh, 2.37 times faster than yarn. 3.44 times faster than PN paper. And almost six times faster than NPM, right? If you're running that over and over again during your day, that can have significant improvements. Uh, Blitter and Bun both support the shared cache single location thing. That can have significant improvements to performance, but also to disk space usage, not just when you're developing, but on your build servers as well. There are really good reasons to think about using these. But anyway, so let's switch back to slides. and. I tried to make a helpful chart. Uh, this I did with Mermaid. If you haven't looked at Mermaid charts yet, go look at Mermaid charts. That is, should be your takeaway. They're amazing. Um, and there's a PowerPoint plugin for Mermaid charts. I just inserted a Mermaid chart into PowerPoint because things are weird. Uh, you can have a look at this. Slides will be available later. Um, I have no idea if it's even accurate. I did this at like 3 in the morning. Um, but the key part here is this. Should you be sticking with Node, right? Like, what projects don't just stick with Node? Can I even run JavaScript on the server side or in a CLI without Node? Well, you can, right? Uh, you can use things like WebAssembly. My good friend, Evald Horn, has a talk that came out yesterday, in fact, uh, up on YouTube. And he talks about running WebAssembly. So you can run JavaScript pretty much anywhere. Um, there are other runtimes. So there's JerryScript and QuickJS. Both of those are exceptionally small JavaScript runtimes for IoT devices. And I mean, like, 
16 or 32K memory requirements. I keep looking at that stat and wondering what's wrong with Chrome though, because clearly these guys got it right. Um, LLRT is an amazing runtime made by AWS, designed specific for Lambdas. So you have super, super fast startups. So if you care about like startup performance and runtime performance, that's a really cool one to look at as well, but it's like very niche usage. Um, but there are some other ones. So let's take a look at them. Again, my nightmares, um, because the first one we're gonna look at is called bun. The same bun you just saw now. So we were having bun there with uh, JavaScript, but we can have bun with other things. I can get my notes up here. Cool. So where are we? Uh, here we are in our woe folder. Not those, not those. We haven't got into this pie. Oh, you know what? That's the wrong IDE. There we go. I was like, right. So let's create index.js, right? Nothing too crazy in here. Uh, log, hello, escape like the cool video said, right? And we can jump back to our console. And if I'm not a terrible developer, that works, right? Awesome. Cool, so let's let's switch this to bun. Uh, and it works. It just works. Um, one of the cool things about bun is they really have tried to make it completely node compatible. So if we go and have a look here, here is a cool little program. It's called VTOP. And VTOP does something, it's slightly old. And I kind of like, I picked it because it is slightly old. Um, but what it does is it gives you a top all in the CLI. Uh, and it's designed, I think it's like six years since the last update, designed for Node, just works still, it's really good code. Um, I quite like it. How does that look if we try running with Bun? Six year old JavaScript, right? Just works. Like print into the screen, it's got mouse integration, it's got all kinds of cool stuff, just works. So that's quite cool. Uh, what about something more complex? So OpenMCT. OpenMCT is a, MCT stands for mission control. It's built by NASA. If you have the need to build your own mission control, there's an open source library for you. If you have a need to build an open source mission control, please speak to me. I'll come write code, it'll be fine. Um, so let's have a look at how this looks. Example, server, index, uh, no, server. And this, we'll pop this up. Oh, yeah, and it's on the wrong screen, because of course. And here we go. Uh, we get some stats. So it's got an example spaceship in here. I've got fuel, 77%. Uh, we can see I'm not sending any, uh, receiving any data from the, the ship yet, but I am sending it data. We have some generators. I can switch back to here. I can hit enter, turn on the thrusters. The generator currents peaked up. We'll start receiving data because the ship's now flying and we'll start eventually falling out of sort of fuel. Uh, and it's got lots of cool things. So you can like zoom in on these graphs. Uh, you can do all kinds of freezing. It's an amazingly well-built system by NASA. Uh, yeah, just lovely piece of code if you are building things. Uh, so let's have a look how run how bun does it, right? So remember, bun compatibility, right? All right, cool. It started up, it started up really quickly. Let's bring it up. Oh, brought it up on the wrong screen again. And it's struggling to load. And it's broken. This is the second time in my life I've broken NASA code. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I broke it once at, when I worked at Amazon. Uh, so you know, this is this is a thing, right? Um, so let's have a look what's going on in here. It's on this function here with the WebSocket support where it's trying to pass out some messages. One of the differences in button versus node is the, the engine at the heart of it. But uh, node is a V8 engine from Chrome. Bun uses the engine from Safari. And there are very, very subtle things that can break. Um, in this case, it's just because it does not automatically two string this in what Safari does. So if we do that, and let's turn the engine on, and let's go back to here. I think we need to refresh now. Here we go, it's all working. I have ported a number of projects from Node to Bun. That's about as tough as it gets normally. Um, there are gonna be some things that might break. If you're writing really sort of stock code, uh, it's fine, but yeah. 
you might run into some little weird things like that. Cool. So that's uh, done on that piece. So now you've seen how it can break and how we can fix it. Let's have a look at something else. Um, who here likes viruses? And who here wants a virus on the computer? Thank you, Dale. Thank you so much for being my, my support here. Right, so uh, I have some code in here. Uh, in your favorite CLI of choice, there is a program called CAT. If you don't use a favorite CLI yet, uh, let me introduce you to FISH. FISH is what I use, and it's the best. So I'm using FISH, and now I have a CAT, and there are ducks. I, I don't know what it is about tech and animals, but we have something there. And um, what I've got here is I've built a very simple node application pretty much as fast as I can do a piece of node, right? So like, redefine, like get a file name from the command line, resolve that, pipe the input, use as an input stream and pipe it to stand it out. This is as fast as you can do anything. And so if I run node, uh, what did I call this for? Uh, it was cat. And then E. coli, because uh, I figured let's have something interesting. Uh, so here's the genetic material well, genetic structure for E. coli. Um, if that inf infects your machine with E. coli, I do apologize. Um, so yeah, that's as fast as you can sort of build your own. Um, I can take this and run this happily on Bun, and it just works. But here's the thing. Bun's goal is not just make it fast, make it compatible. They're like, can't we do better? So if we jump back into here, and we'll bring this up. This is the bun version, same code, same goal of code. But you'll note that we are bringing something called bun this time with its own functions, right? It's pretty much, it still reads the same as JavaScript, right? Um, but it just works. The other cool thing is this isn't TypeScript, right? I, we haven't gotten into this, looked at TypeScript yet, and I mentioned it's something we all use. It'd be quite cool if you could just run TypeScript, right? So we can, bun supports. TypeScript out the box with no compiling, no change. No, oh, fun. What is it called? Oh, TS. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I told you we'd go and do this together. There you go, right? As fast as we can, which is pretty cool. How much faster, though, is that code? Let's throw it at Hyperfine again and see what happens. While that runs, who wants a duck? Wow, I got a better throwing arm than Dale. <laughs> there we go. The simplest piece of code that I could come up with, right? Reading a file and throwing it at the screen. Bun is twice as fast. Like IO performance, everything is just so much faster. It's really, really impressive. Uh, and so you can get really good performance improvements just by swapping out your runtime. And it's fairly simple to do. And it's fairly easy to do it in an incremental way. So you swap, you just change the runtime. Day one, day two, you start going through your code, fixing what breaks. Day three, you start replacing the code from node things to button things, and you get it. Um, so yeah, as we mentioned, Node.js compatible is a goal. It's got really good module support, TypeScript, JavaScript, all the JSX and TS stuff all sorted. If you want to push to the web, it has a built-in bundler. So you don't have to use like Webpack. Um, a bundler, a bundler and bun, as opposed to, I guess you heard a bundler, which is, I guess, what we should call Webpack. Um, sure. Uh, it's got a full test, a JS compatible test runner, so you can run unit tests in it. That in itself is worth just doing. Like you can run your test three, four times faster. So if you are running continuously on your machine, just imagine your test finishing three times, four times faster. Uh, and obviously all the built-in stuff, we saw one there just for reading files, but it's got its own built-in web server with sockets routing the whole experience. So that's Bun. Um, next up is Deno. I wanted to put a slide here with a picture of my nightmare on, de on presenting demo, Deno, but I don't know what Deno meant. Um, so I went to Google as one does, and actually I didn't, I use, I use Kagi, which is a much better search engine, um, but you have to try it, go try Kagi. Um, and I, I, I searched on Kagi and found Little Sword as the meaning. This is from a baby naming website. Um, 
I'm not sure what was going on that people were naming Deno in this big area, but right down here, there's the little spike there, and that's 2007, if I remember. Um, what was happening in 2007 that people were like, Deno is cool again? Um, what really also stood out to me when I did this um, was my name's here listed as a suggested sibling. What the hell? <laughs> like, I'm still the over. This is a literal nightmare when like computers like, yeah, yeah, you're doing a talk on Deno. You should name your siblings Deno. Like, what? Anyway, um, yeah, I just thought that was weird and interesting. So let's have a look at Deno. Right. So here we are. Uh, let's jump back to the console and go to Whoa. And did you see that? Look at the cool NVM change thing. Right. Uh, so we have our cat, uh, our index.js from earlier, right? Console, hello world thing, right? Let's uh, demo that. Index.js. It works. Woohoo. I mean, it's one line as a console. It, it's pretty fun, pretty okay, right? Uh, let's go back and have a look at something a little bit more complex, like cat. And let's do the E. coli. Nope. Deno does not believe in require. Require does not exist in Deno in the code that you write. You can bring in modules to Deno that use require, but they have made the stand. It's an opinionated stand that require is the wrong way to write code. So if you write code with require, it will freak out. Uh, that's OK. We can fix that. We can do these things. Uh, let's bring it up here. We have a cool IDE. It has little features. Convert, right? Do the same thing. Blech. Another problem, right? In this case, it wants some prefixes. OK, we can fix this. We can fix this. Let's add some prefixes. OK, because these need to come from Node. Oh, and now there's another thing, because process are not defined. Deno does not care about your Node code compatibility. Or Deno 1 does not care about your co Node code compatibility. Deno is um, its own magic land. So we need to treat it like its own magic land. So let's have a Deno folder. If you want to get started with Deno, it is as simple as this. And we can jump back to here. There's our Deno folder. We have a main file, simple code in here. We've got a test running in their test runner. And we have their version of package.json. Um, which we'll talk about a bit more in a moment. One of the cool things in here is this. This tells you if your code was run directly or through, or if it was imported as a module, because uh, they support runtime metadata, which you don't get on Node. And you'll note everything is TypeScript, because TypeScript is the language that you should be writing in, according to Deno. So yeah, works really well. We can go back here, Deno run dev. That will spring up the server. It's got a full watch system in it. You know, this is always the, the cool thing. You can change it. Now, it's like change it back. It, it's nice and fast. It picks up changes. You can run tests. You can do all of that th sort of stuff. And honestly, if we look at this, this doesn't look too bad. I mean, this is just normal JavaScript and TypeScript, right? Well, this is normal TypeScript because we've got type annotations. Um, but And it's fairly readable, right? Like, this reads pretty much like every test I've ever written with Jest. Um, it's not massively different. So let's go see how well it does with our cat example. There's Deno's version of this, as tight and small as possible. Uh, there are no imports because Deno ships with a lot of built-in things. You can see you got Deno open, open a file. I can wait on that, top level awaits all supported put that into input, and then I output that to Deno standard out writable. This is going to go, this is going to go great, right? Everyone's like, yeah, Robert, you know what you're doing. Your talks are great. Blah! What the hell happened to E. coli? It suddenly has words. So Deno is interesting in that when they made it, they looked at the JavaScript engine inside it, which is V8, same as on, on Node, and went, one of the amazing things about that engine is how sandboxed it is. You can build super secure code. And Node kind of decided not to use that. Deno goes, you know, we're going to embrace this thing. 
So here, what it is saying is that I, my code is trying to read this file. And I'm, am I OK with that? This is super powerful if you are worried about security, if you are worried about supply chain attacks, because it does not get permission to do stuff unless you give it permission. So now we can give it permission, and it will spit out onto the screen now. It's really, really nice to do that. Let's do something more complex. Uh, it is 2024, obviously. Dale's talk is amazing, and he has AI in his talk. So I want to be cool, as we all do. So let's throw some AI in. Uh, that's not the right file. That's the right file. So let's replace that. Boom. Cool. Uh, this is the smallest piece of AI I could come up with. This uses uh, OpenAI's uh, 4.0 mini model to do something. And I'm doing, bringing in some code and writing the screen. Nice and simple. Does anything stand out to anyone there? There are no ducks on that screen at the moment. The word duck is. Come on, somebody shout. What? My import statement. I, uh, there are like, you know, waivers for people here. Oh, no. All right. Uh, I'm importing from a URL. When Deno was originally created, that was all they were going to support. This concept that you can just bring in code from a URL. You don't need NPM, the package repository. You can put it anywhere. Think how amazing that is inside a company. Think how amazing that is when you want to share code. You just put it somewhere. Think how amazing that is for security vulnerabilities, because then somebody could just change that code. Don't think about that. Don't think about that. Um, but yeah, so let's have a look at this. Uh, we want to go back to the demo folder. And we want to run this. Uh, so demo run index again. Oh, main. Another thing, they, they default to main instead of index. Cool. Uh, and what is it doing now? Asking for permissions. This time, environment variables, not just files. OK, you can have an environment variable, and another one, and another one, and another one. That, that all comes from the library I imported from a URL. And now, do you want to go to this website? Right? OK. And then that makes a call, and it tells us a joke. Why did the duck become a programmer? because it wanted to crack the code. <laughs> cool. Um, obviously, you don't have to live in that life where you prompt everything. So you can give it an A, and it will give you another cool joke. Uh, you can also specify what permissions you want and however you like that. Um, but as I was saying, this is how they wanted it. If you watch the original talk about this, uh, which Ryan Dahl, the creator of Deno, did, and if you know people in programming, Reindel's the creator of Node. Deno comes from him looking back at Node and going, what is wrong with what I built? Deno's the replacement. And that's what he wanted. In the six years that Deno has been worked on, they've embraced some more things. So what I can do now is this. Deno add npm open AI. And it pulls it down. It does its thing. Cool. And let's actually look what it did. We have it in our file here, kind of like package JSON. We have a lock file. Note, though, let's make it a little bit here. There is no node modules because it puts them in this folder on somewhere else on your hard drive, and you don't have to care. It will manage that for you. Right? You just get your code in your folder and no other nonsense which is lovely. And now I can go here and change this out to npm open AI and rerun this. And it works the same. So I get all the cool benefits of being able to have some, maybe some code in my company shared in across file shares and code uh, that's in public repositories also shared across. But Deno didn't stop there. So they decided the area that needs most help next is NPM, the package repository. Because NPM has no competition. It's the default. And it's stagnant. 
They don't add interesting new features. They don't try to do stuff. Ryan Dahl came up with this. It's called JSR. It's his version of package manager, a package repository to compete with NPM. And uh, I built this in about 20 minutes, this, this piece of code, and got it up here. You'll see I've got a standard readme file with uh, that there. You'll see I support not only Deno, but you can bring this into NPM, Yarn, uh, the, and Bun. So it, it works everywhere. If I go into Docs, and we hit, oops, go into Docs, go into Docs, I keep clicking the wrong thing. Full documentation, right? I didn't do that, by the way, because I'm lazy. Um, I mean, I'm efficient, sorry, I'm efficient. Here's my code that I uploaded. This was built for Deno, right? It's got a Deno.json, it's got the readme you've seen. If we go into source, here's the code. That docs is automatically built out of JavaScript annotations. Um, what you don't see in here is a dist folder. You don't see any weird packaging stuff because why should you give a shit? That's it. Why should you care how the you write code? You want it to go places. Deno, NPM, Yarn, et cetera. I don't have to do anything. When you upload your code, or actually, sorry, I keep saying upload, but when you connect it to your GitHub, it brings in the code from there and it figures out packaging for you. And it does that. You don't. It's just your code. This is literally all there is to it. It's a normal, in this case, it's one file and it works. Um, obviously, it's got version dependencies, things like that. Final cool thing here is a score. It scores all your packages. Why is this important? Because when you are looking at pad left versus pad right, or is true versus is false, or something where you have to decide which is the more correct package to use, it's really good if you had some things to know about it that are outside the author's control. This it generates based on what I upload. This is cool. This is really, really cool. Um, and obviously, it's very easily supported. So we can go here. And we will scroll down and grab the how to add it, which will feel very natural to most people. So I'll add that to my project. Um, again, if you are interested, here's how it runs in all the other ones, right? You just like use your NPM, NPX, and you can add it to your normal node projects. So we've added that in there. Uh, we jump back to the code. You'll see it's in there. And we'll bring in some more code for this. Uh, simple. I wanted to show this one quite like this because a lot of the time we just pull stuff from the internet and we use fetch. Another core tenant of Deno is web compatibility. The web is important. So let's be compatible. Nodes fetch is not the same fetch as in your browser. It's way more complex. This is the same fetch signature as in your browser. They don't do globals like node. They do window like your browser. Your browser is important. So if we jump into here, we can now do deno run main, and it will spit out some text that it pulled from our website and colorize it. And there we go, nice and simple. Cool. So that's deno. It brings it on. So it has some node compatibility, as we saw at the very first demo, but it's not always node compatible. That's going to change. Deno version two is coming out later this year. Goal one on that is 100% node compatibility. If you are interested, when I saw that talk, this talk, I didn't know that. I was going to be like, hey, if you've got node code, switch to bun, things will be better. I'm now more increasingly of like, if you have node code, can you wait a few months and then go to Deno two? And if you're starting a new project, start out on Deno one, because it's just going to be better. Uh, obviously, they've made a stake on ES modules, um, but you can still use common JS in anything you import. Uh, JSX, all that sort of stuff built in. You get a single executable file for Deno. You can literally install it by copying it onto your machine. And it has a benchmarking tool inside it. An executable compiler will take your JavaScript or TypeScript and make an executable out of it that you can then pass on. It has a full test runner, a full code coverage, a full linter, a full formatter, and a full documents tool so that you no longer have like bike shedding arguments with your team about what the right way to have semicolons is. 
like it's just gone, it's all there. You get one tool and it works. Very much inspired by what happens in Rust, where it's like, here's your tools, focus on what's important, not what tool you want to use. I mentioned web standards before, we've seen the secure by default, uh, and obviously it's got all the cool built-in sort of stuff. So yeah, how do these compare performance-wise? I mean, that was kind of why some people came. Um, and Bun wins most of the time, uh, followed by Deno, followed by Node.js. Um, hi, five minutes? Yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. Um, I, I, five minutes and then lunch. I can keep going, right? Just, that's what you were trying to say. Thank you. Um, let's run this demo now. No. Um, if you watch the stuff people talk about Deno, they are quite unhappy with how Bun cherry picks performance tests. They feel like they're cl very close to Bun's performance. My experience is Bun is still faster more often than not, uh, but Deno is pretty close. And Node is pretty slow. Um, this here, these benchmarks are taken on a HTTP server. Uh, like it was written across all three of them to do like high process transaction and stuff. Um, and yeah, you can just get like a nice performance Bun just by swapping to these. So yeah, so what did we see today? What do you want to take from this, right? We saw different, uh, different package managers, Bun, Blah, uh, uh, Yarn. Um, we saw a different package repo with JSR, which is pretty cool. And we saw different runtimes, and hopefully you feel like you should go, oh, it's still the same language you love, and unless you're lucky and it makes you cry for some reason. Uh, and should you go back to the office, change all your projects, the new hotness you've just seen at a conference, no, please don't. Like, I don't want your boss to email me and go, you're terrible. Like, really what I hope you take from this session is the same thing you took from the keynote, right? We are a collective of our minds. We are not individual, like, thoughts or whatever. Challenge your thinking. That's all I hope you take from this. I hope you see that there are other tools out there that you can maybe make JavaScript a bit better and faster, because modern JavaScript is just getting better and better. Cool, I have two animations. Um, I don't know that. We all learn together. So let's see how we code again just to wrap this up. Step one, get clone, nice and simple. Step two, challenge your assumptions. Step three, adopt a rescue dog. I'm wrong about most things, but a rescue dog will make you a better person and will help, like fix a hole in your heart you did not know. And then, you know, when you get it, you can boopy snooze. It's just the best. I miss my dogs. Um, don't compare what you might feel about yourself to what you're seeing here. None of my demos crash out, which I'm quite cool. But I've spent like a lot of time prepping this. Most of this didn't work a week ago, right? Like I'm panicking, right? You can do this. You can be on stages. You can be using new tech. You can be awesome. Don't compare yourself to what you see. This is just like the best version of it. Thank yourselves for making JavaScript 20% better today because we did this together. And finally, step six, profit. Cool. And that is it. I have one minute and five seconds left. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess I got time for one question. Sure.